Libertarianism is pro-immigration, pro-market, pro-trade. More competitive, less centralized. Not military confrontations, but peaceful interaction. The war on drugs has been actually an unmitigated disaster. It's fortunate. But if you don't produce, you can't share anything. It's like the thing on the airplane. First put on your own oxygen mask before you try to help somebody else. You gotta get your own breath strengthened before you can help somebody get theirs going. So each of you have a responsibility to do the best you can for yourself and your future families and the people who come behind you. Competition, creative destruction, Joseph Schumpeter. This is about shopping. None of you will go out and willy-nilly just buy something, especially of a major purchasing cost, because you're going to check it out and make sure that it's not only the best quality you can get for the money, but it's the lowest price you can achieve. And it is this kind of competition that keeps your producers and your suppliers competing for your dollar and your interest. Creative destruction is the way you uh, ration goods and services to the most efficient providers. If you're not competitive, you go out of business. The mom and pop grocery stores have lost out to Publix and to uh, Amazon and all the other major food stores. And you can shop at 7-Eleven, but everything you buy in there is going to cost you 20 to 50 percent more than it would in the larger store. That's competition. Trade. I put this in gold letters because this is where the gold is. Comparative advantage. All of you have certain talents. Some of you are better at music than you are at engineering or economics or math. Everybody's got individual talents. You take those talents and you employ them where you can get the best return for your time and your intellect. And to the degree that each of us does that, we will advance the society we live in because they're getting the most productivity out of each individual person's intellect and talent. We don't grow bananas in North Dakota, we grow wheat because wheat grows well in dry land. And they don't grow wheat in the tropics because it's too wet for wheat in the tropics. So we trade. We take what we do best and trade it for somebody else's goods and what they do best. This applies to goods, this applies to services, this applies to talent. It applies to anything you can think of. The whole idea is any, any uh, mutually agreed upon exchange between parties advances the condition of both people. If I want your phone and you want my watch and we agree to trade, both of us come on ahead. I got what I wanted and so did you. Nobody got hurt, but it had to be mutually agreeable and mutually beneficial. That's what trade's about. Sensible immigration policy has always been part of our national lexicon, but that's legal immigration. There was a time in this country between about 1930 and 1965 when we had zero immigration. They cut it off completely. They locked up the Japanese in World War II even though they were American born because they were worried about the foreigners. Well, that was the wrong thing to do. But the bottom line is we don't owe this country to anybody. You don't go away and leave your house or your dorm room unlocked because, not because you don't trust the people outside, but because you love the people inside. And we don't have to let people come here who don't have our best interests at heart or who don't want to become American patriots, productive citizens who love this country. And that's got to be straightened out. And again, your politicians, for the most part, will not address this. They're so worried about losing a vote that they will let the country be overrun by people who, in many instances, are highly productive and have all the best intentions. But they also come here illegally to start the, the whole venture off. But there's an awful lot of people in there who don't have our best interests at heart. Anybody in here thinks, why do open immigration is great? Give me your name and address, and I'll see if the State Department would like to move three of these guys in with you. It's not the way to have a successful country. How about democracy? You need democracy to have prosperity? I think not. Strangely enough, they don't have democracy in China, but it's one of the most prosperous countries in the world. They gave them 
opportunity without liberty. Now, they have economic liberty, they are very creative, they're very hardworking, and they're, they're ragingly wealthy. They're getting, they're catching up with us very rapidly. They don't have political autonomy, they don't have liberty in their political structures. And the only way that China could have grown the way it is, is the way they did it. They have an autocracy, which means everything is run by a central control, but they turn the people loose with their innovations and their endeavors, and it's made the country staggeringly wealthy. In fact, in America, capitalism predated our federal republic by centuries. I don't know whether you know it or not, but the word democracy does not appear in the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution. Our founders were terrified of wide open democracy because they saw it as tyranny of the masses. Keep in mind, the founders were all educated. Most of them were well, well to do. They were trying to structure society where people could have order and opportunity, but nobody could come and take their property. And they didn't, you know, if all of you voted that you're going to come up here and take my money, what could I do about that? That would be democracy. All of you against me. Well, I couldn't stop it. But you don't want that. We are a nation of laws, and that's what a republic is. We have rule of law, not rule of man. That's what they have in Venezuela. How's that working out for them? This chart shows households with real purchasing power incomes greater than 20000 a year. This is generally defining the global middle class. The red area is the developed countries without the U.S., roughly 300 million homes. The green area is the developing countries. Back in 1994, you had roughly 400 million homes outside of the U.S., 1.6 billion people, as part of the global middle class. By 2014, 20 years later, you added 1.7 billion people to the global middle class in 20 years. That is a stunning achievement. It took all of history to get to here, and it doubled in 20 years. The projection is that this is going to reach over a billion families in the global middle class by 2022. That's 4.3 million people. That's an additional billion people in the next eight years. Or, well, actually, three years from now. Now, the reason I know about all this stuff is because I spent a lifetime in the vegetable oil and protein business. I was trying to figure out what was going to make our industry grow. As poor people advance economically, they move from grains to vegetable oils to meat. Now, if you're very, very poor, you do not buy meat or vegetable oil. I'm talking to people that live on less than a dollar a day, and there's over two billion of them in the world. Very poor people do not buy Wesson oil or margarine or anything like that. They certainly don't buy meat. But as they go up the food chain, they start to buy vegetable oil. They, they move from raw grains uh, and, and anything they can forage for or capture or fish for, and they move into vegetable oils like stir-fry, and then they move up to meat in their diet. In the poorest countries, the IMF uses per capita vegetable oil consumption as a measure of living standard changes. They can't measure income in a lot of these countries because people don't have paychecks. It's not all cut and dry like we have. But what they can measure is the amount of contained vegetable oil that enters any particular environment because it's all got to be packaged, distributed, moved, it's all quantifiable. So they take that, they run it against the population estimates, and they get a PC standard of vegetable oil consumption. Now soybeans, um, most of you have never really seen soybeans. You think you have, but edamame is not soybeans. Soybeans are little round pellets, and they're 80% dry matter, which is the soybean meal and they're 20% oil, vegetable oil. So soybeans roughly equate to protein, and that protein gets fed to livestock, primarily swine and poultry, and it turns into meat. But the people who are going to buy this meat have to be prosperous. They've got to have money. So in order to grow the world's soybean crop, the world demand for soybeans, you've got to have ever more people moving into the middle class and prospering. 
they become new consumers of vegetable oil and meat. Very poor people did not purchase meat. When I was seven years old, my father was a railroad switchman. We had six kids in my family. He came home one afternoon and told my mother, I got laid off. So they fussed around for a while. She said, well, we'll just stop buying meat until Dad goes back to work. So we lived on spaghetti and beans and rice until my dad went back to work because we couldn't afford meat. Well, if you're living on less than a dollar a day or two dollars a day, you're not buying pork chops, you're not buying, you're not buying any kind of meat. You're living on stir fry and other kinds of things. This prosperity expansion boosts protein demand worldwide. In the developing countries, widespread job creation and rapidly advancing income spurred dramatically improved dietary intake. The result was an unprecedented expansion of world vegetable oil and protein consumption. This is world vegetable oil production. Now, vegetable oil is Western oil. For those of you, you know, you think oil is petroleum, it's not. This is vegetable oil. It comes in bottles at the grocery store, you put it in your salads, Vegetable oil is in 60% of the food items in the grocery store. All you got to do is look at the labels and it will list vegetable oils. It's in all the chips, everything you make, every, most of what you fry, you've got vegetable oil in it. Well, back in 1980, the world produced, this is the big nine, palm, soybean, rape, etc., produced 34 million tons of vegetable oil for world consumption. Amounted to 69 percent of world vegetable oil distribution. By 2018, this had grown to 178 million tons, and the big four encompassed 87 percent of the total. In other words, world production sextuples in 38 years. Now, in order for production to sextuple, you've got to have demand that equals that. These guys don't raise this stuff to put it on a shelf. They raise it to, sell, to sell to consumers. So in order to have this much growth, you've got to have ever-growing demand base, which is a, a direct result of the growth in prosperity, opportunity, shared benefit. World population grew 71% while this was growing 500%. That means that world production of oil outpaced population growth by a factor of seven. Seven. I don't care how benevolent you think you are, how much you care about the downtrodden, the less fortunate, the hungry, the disadvantaged. You can't get them there with socialism. You can't even have socialism without capitalism because there's nothing to redistribute. If somebody's not producing, there's nothing to steal to give away after you take your cut. Production is what creates wealth. Wealth is what creates food demand. If you take out 25 million tons of this for biodiesel and other kinds of industrial uses, you still outpace population by a factor of six. Now you see up here, palm oil grew 1400% while the second uh, oil in the world, soybean oil, grew by 500% and rapeseed oil by 600%. Anybody want to guess why this grew so fast? It's because palm oil is the easiest to make and the cheapest. And people don't care if it's the same function, which is what palm oil is, same function as soybean and rape. They're all just vegetable oils. They have very slightly different characteristics. Some are slightly healthier than others. Bottom line is, people just want to eat. They're not that fussy. Yes? Sir. Just curious why uh, corn isn't on the Everybody chart. thinks corn oil is a big deal. It's not even on the list. Right, that's it's just not that much. It's just not that much. They advertise it. That's the only difference. This other stuff, everybody's eating and you, don't, you just don't know it. Additions to the global middle class. New tangible productivity supply generates revenue. Revenue minus cost yields income. Income married with desire creates demand. Desire, hunger, is nothing without wherewithal. 